Hi, everyone. I am super honored, nostalgic, and elated to be back here today at King's Academy, my alma mater. This is the high school that I graduated from. It's where I spent a chunk of my childhood and made some of the best memories of my life. It's also where I learned to ask fundamental questions in life. Can humans become super intelligent? And will we ever achieve our greatest potential? Nowadays, we hear so much about AI. One minute you see screaming headlines like, oh my God, AI is gonna end humanity. And then everybody's complaining about how slow ChatGPT is. So where is AI heading and what does it really mean for humanity? These questions have been the underlying theme of my life's work. Over the last decade, we've witnessed the infancy of AI. Just like a child learning to perceive the world around it, we've taught machines to see, listen, speak, and understand natural language. And this was the first wave in AI, where it predicts the object in an image or the words in an audio file. So AI has learned to understand the world around it. But the real question is, what will it do with all that knowledge? And now we're in the second major wave in AI, the generative wave. And although generative AI was only recently popularized by ChatGPT, it has been an ongoing area of research for years. I personally started working on it back in 2016. And Gen AI takes this a step further. Now that our models have a representation of the world around them, they can do the opposite. Instead of processing information, they can now generate or produce new information. We can say, given that you understand what an elephant looks like and what the moon looks like, generate an elephant on the moon for me. And AI can now generate images, videos, code, and writing. It can generate blueprints, chemical formulas, new proteins. And this is exactly what we want from AI. Medical breakthroughs to curing cancer, new and better solutions to global challenges like climate change. Once we perfect and get this right, we will be headed towards an era of radical abundance. Imagine a world where every single person on Earth has access to the ultimate array of assistance. Every person has their own top-tier scientific advisor, your own research assistant, a team of software engineers, a chief of staff who orchestrates your life, or a tutor that enlightens you. Historically, access to such resources was exclusively for the wealthy. We will all have access to, re to these resources, our personal intelligence right in our pocket. Everything that you see around you in the world is a byproduct of intelligence. Intelligence is what creates the new iPhone or a cheaper couch and everything in between. And as the cost of intelligence goes down, the abundance rate goes up. And with that comes an age of unparalleled creativity, humanity's limitless potential. Now and over the next five years, we are on the cusp of the third wave. And this is where AI accomplishes end-to-end -end tasks or entire roles without requiring any human intervention. You will be able to, it will be able to reason and plan ahead, and you will be able to tell an AI, here's an investment of $50,000, build a business for me. And it will generate a series of actions and accomplish them on your behalf. So it will develop uh, the idea, it will build a website, generate marketing material, it will even call one of your suppliers and negotiate with them on, be on your behalf and sell your product. Eventually, we will see a one-person unicorn. A business that goes from zero to a billion dollars in value with just one person running it with the rest of the roles automated with AI. Do you know how many employees Instagram had when it was acquired for a billion dollars? Twelve. When WhatsApp was acquired for $20 billion, it only had 50 employees. That is insane. And historically, you couldn't scale a business with such minimal headcount. It was an extreme rarity. But with AI, the cost of taking a new idea to market, the cost of scaling a business, the cost of getting the highest quality education possible or access to the best doctors is becoming so cheap that everyone in the world will have access to it. And I know what you're thinking. If AI is gonna be a doctor, a lawyer, a consultant, what will happen to jobs? And the answer is, it depends on the time frame. Over the next 10 years, some jobs will be entirely automated, while others will be augmented. On the flip side, many new jobs will be created, but we still don't know what they are. And you can say, Karim, you call yourself an expert. You're claiming new jobs will be created, but you can't tell what they are. Of course, no one with any logical sense could have predicted before the internet that we will have an app store that hosts millions of apps, and just one of those apps will individually create millions of new jobs. So not only new jobs will be created, new economies will be created. And we need to look at every sector and restructure it for the future. Even education needs to be rebooted. Today, in general, we teach kids to be robotic test takers, and humans will not beat computers at taking tests, at multiple choice, at chemical formulas, or memorizing history. We need to teach the next generation of students qualities that AI does not have. Curiosity, creativity, problem solving, teamwork, collaboration, love, empathy, how to win trust. 
AI will generate, generate personalized homework for every student based on their strengths and weaknesses, and it will take the boring and mundane parts of the job away from teachers. Teachers must be highly regarded leaders in society because they drive the next generation of children. They will focus on delivering value to our children rather than grading homework. Also, some of us are very passionate, are very lucky to be doing things that we're passionate about for work, but not everyone feels this way. Some people are so unhappy working a dreadful nine to five job that they hate. And because of AI, we will not work because we need to. We will work because we want to. Have you ever went into a meeting and thought to yourself, man, this could have been an email? Every single person will have a personal agent, and my agent will talk to yours, they will communicate and report back to us. So, in a world where we have personal agents, infinite doctors, infinite labor, expertise, personalized medicine, and media, we will see a fundamental shift in the structure of society. There will come a time where we say goodbye to mundane tasks and welcome in a joyous life where each of us is living uh, and chasing their dreams and living in prosperity. So, will AI take over the world? Yes, and when they see this video, they will know that I helped them. It's the only reason I'm doing this talk. No, that's not going to happen. It's important to know that these tools are not just autonomous by default. Their capabilities do not just randomly emerge out of nowhere. We build these models and we build them to, uh, to, to excel in certain tasks. So we have to be very careful and deliberate about what we build. But the, but the risks are very real. This is the most transformative technology that humans have ever built. It's bigger than electricity and the internet combined. So in order to mitigate these risks, we need to first be cognizant of them. And second, we must impose our own constraints on these models and plan for their rollout. And we must collectively take action. This is a global and concerted effort. And as humans, we have good qualities and we also have bad qualities. And AI exacerbates both of them. So we must have mechanisms in place to stop the spread of misinformation through fake news. And especially on regulation, it must be implemented very precisely and carefully. Because if we impose heavy regulation, then only the large companies will fulfill them. And that will concentrate power in the hands of a few. And if we loosen it up too much, then it eradicates the constraints that we have in place. So we have to strike a balance between these two things. So how far is all of this from happening? It's important to know that as we scale the size of these models, we see a significant improvement in their performance. But the rate of innovation here is not incremental, it's exponential. And the timeline that it takes for groundbreaking technologies to proliferate globally has been consistently shrinking. The PC took 20 years to reach half the population of the US. Internet took 12 years and mobile only took six. So it won't be long before generative AI and personal agents reach a tipping point globally. And there are some challenges ahead, so how do we go from here to there? First, the first challenge is training data. A lot of people today are saying that we will run out of quality training data because large language models like ChatGPT have already been trained on all of the data that's available in the public domain or on the internet. But that's a fallacy. Because if you calculate, if you put a number on the amount of data that goes through a child's, a five-year-old child's eye, an average five-year-old child has seen way, way more data than the best and largest models that we have today than what they've seen in text. So the question is not whether we have enough data, we have more than enough data. The question is what type of new model architectures must we build? And first is we need to build models that better learn through video. And also as humans, we also do things out in the world, we have experiences and based on that we learn and we adjust and we improve. So we need to build models that can learn through this notion of cause and effect. And also as humans, your brain automatically switches between different modes of thinking. So if I ask you, what is one plus one? You will immediately say the answer is two. If I ask you, what is 99 times 981? You will need to think about it. Your brain automatically switches between these different modes of thinking. Current models cannot do that. They cannot do complex reasoning and planning. And also, Current generative models are not very smart. They make mistakes, they sometimes hallucinate. So, for example, if we ask this model, who is the mother of Tom Cruise? It will say Mary Lee Pfeiffer, and that's correct. But if we flip it around and we ask, who is Mary Lee Pfeiffer? It won't know that. So, we have found solutions, temporary solutions to these problems, but in order to completely solve them, we need to build fundamentally new architectures. And if you're a builder, you might be thinking to yourself, this is crazy. All of these things will be invented by large companies. And I very strongly disagree. Let's take a look at history. The massive disruptive innovations almost never come from who you'd expect them to. 
Who revolutionized the hospitality industry? It wasn't Marriott or Hilton, it was Airbnb. Who revolutionized the transportation industry? It wasn't Hertz or Avis, it was a startup called Uber. What about media? It wasn't the outlets, it was a startup called Facebook. And in retail, it was a startup called Amazon. So it's not the ones with the most resources, it's the ones who are stubborn enough to build the seemingly impossible. The ones who relentlessly pursue opportunities without any regard to lack of resources. They are the ones who know how to fight asymmetrically. And with advancements in AI, this is even more true. Because by the time they can get the whole team together to have a meeting and discuss this, you will have already generated the entire app using AI. So it's also an equalizer. So I encourage you all to have a closer look at it and embrace it. See, I took two classes in this, in, at King's Academy here that changed the trajectory of my life philosophy and psychology. They fueled my obsession with the universe energies and neuroscience, and that led me to AI. And by the time I graduated law school from London, I knew that being a lawyer wasn't for me. So I moved to Canada, and after winning a competition with NASA there, I started building a dream recorder, a device that you wear during sleep, and when you wake up, you can watch a video of what you dreamt about, exactly how you saw it. And usually when I say that, I get two kinds of reactions. The first one is like this, and the second one is like this. I like the second one more. Remember those generative models that I was telling you about? When you give them a text prompt and you generate an image, what I was doing is I was giving them brain signals and generating images and videos from brain signals. After that, I built a device that you wear that lets you talk to other users or Siri or Alexa without actually talking, using your intention to speak. And also worked on detecting emotions from brain signals so that computers around us can adapt to our every need. And essentially what I was building here is an operating system for the brain, a, uh, a layer that allows you to build apps that interact directly with the brain. And today, Meta's cutting-edge research that was released just a few months ago in October is one of the things that I patented seven years ago. And today I hold patents that have been cited against major players like Sony, Meta, and others. And after that, I moved from building to investing in builders as a VC and working with large, large corporations and governments to help them innovate. And most recently, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Uktub.ai. And at Uktub, we enable businesses to deploy AI teammates or AI uh, agents in under five minutes that enable them to run certain aspects of their businesses 95% cheaper, 45 times faster, with far better results. Our agents today can already make phone calls. They can operate a web browser to accomplish any task that a human can perform online. And although they're multilingual, we've perfected the Arabic language. So because of these two classes that I took in this very special high school, my life took a completely different trajectory. The universe works in mysterious ways, but it works beautifully. So I personally am very excited and optimistic about the future, and I hope that we can make the best of it. Thank you so much.